the barge that hit the the bridge what all have you heard because i have seriously seen so many damn TikTok videos about this thing collapsing the bridge and all the conspiracy theories i want to know what's going on with it it is super wild so as a lot of you know i suffer with insomnia so i'm up like all night long so right when that happened i i was like on TikTok, and i'm like oh my god look at this video like i was blown away by what I saw, I had to keep rewinding it. At that same moment, all of my worst intrusive thoughts were unlocked. Mm -hmm. Literally, I have a lot of intrusive thoughts. So like, I'm thinking, you know, every time I drive over a bridge, that's the only thought that's always gonna be in my head from now on, thank you. And you know what's crazy? I've, al I've also seen other videos of people showing other bridges that are very traveled that are like falling apart, literally. The George Washington Bridge being one of them in New York. So, yes, that is happening all over the place. A lot of that is because lack of funding, like COVID screwed a lot of stuff up and some of the maintenance wasn't kept on. Like, But they charge you to go over those bridges, bro. It ain't, it ain't like cheap. Like they do. They The charge to go over like the George Washington Bridge, I forget what it is, but it's not. Like they need to be keeping up with maintenance of the roads in my opinion. But you know where that stuff goes? All the city, that's city funding. So right. it's it's going to go to line people's pockets. My biggest thing is, so a lot of people were very confused about, it looks like in the video, the boat like corrects course and literally goes for the bridge. So if you don't know what was happening, the boat was losing power. It was having some sort of issue with its power where it lost power once and they managed to get power back and tried to correct it and whenever that didn't work they lost power again and then that is when the boat hit the bridge and in a lot of the videos you can kind of see like everyone saying oh it made a sharp turn and is heading straight for the bridge that sharp turn is because they tried to save it and they dropped anchor and the anchor did not catch, but it caught enough to pull the boat. If they wouldn't have dropped anchor, it might not have hit, but. So it was like the perfect storm of catastrophic yeah. events. Well, you know what's they... crazy? No matter what, and TikTok is huge for this because I, I, I myself fall down so many rabbit holes, mm -hmm. but with anything comes a conspiracy theory like there right. there are people that literally will rewind videos they'll listen to the sound they'll take a dark video make it light and for this look so they were able to get the construction crew the so there was a construction crew on there that they weren't able to get I don't really understand that because whenever they noticed what was happening, they did the precaution and they shut off two sides of the bridge and was like, there was a decent gap. The problem is those things are so dang load bearing. Whenever that one section went, the whole rest got taken with it. So a whole bunch of cars went down and then there was a construction crew on there that they had no idea what the heck was going on. They were just working. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's it's down. And so many people were talking about why were there not tugboats and all types of stuff. So that area, that river, larger ships do not actually need tugboats. That is, that's not super common, but like if you're out on, um, I think all the rivers around New York, every boat has to have a tugboat or something. So yeah, it's, there is a whole lot of bad parts of that situation. The biggest thing is I it's going to affect so much like financially. I can't remember how much they said, but that one bridge brings in like ninety six million dollars worth of like products and goods and all types. Right. Of stuff. And, it, and it goes it, it, like a lot of those ships are back and forth to China, probably Temu. Yeah. Like large corporations, probably TikTok shop. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, let's be on. real. If it is an attack and that was actually the goal of it, though, I mean, they're going to cripple the city quite a bit. But what would be the point of that? That's the biggest thing you got to look at for conspiracy theories. Why would someone do that? 
I mean, because affecting one city's kind of infrastructure and their their economy like that isn't going to do an overwhelming amount. So I just don't see how people can think it's an attack. And then like the people that have to go to back and forth to work every day, like imagine, you know, already having a long commute and then now having to completely reroute your whole entire day over oh, yeah. something like that. Yeah, the, right. there are probably a, a ton of people who right. still haven't been to work. Like, you can work from home because, yeah, there's there's nothing you can do in those situations. Yeah. It's, uh, that is my worst fear. My One of my worst fears is definitely drowning. But it's also, like, falling like that and being, like, stuck. Like, that claustrophobicness of, like, going underwater. You yeah. know what I searched up since this? I ordered one of those things that... that cuts the seatbelt and smashes and the window. Glass. Yeah. You know how hard it is to break car glass. If, right. you're, if you don't mean to do it, you can do it on accident, no problem. But if you're trying to actually do it, it's so freaking hard. And then you got to think about like, if the car is starting to get submerged, you have to keep going up like to the tail end of the car. You got to, yeah. You got to get, like they say, to get the oldest kids out first. But mm -hmm. like all these things, the amount of pressure that's surrounding that car, it's it would be harder to break glass. Like you think you'd be able to stomp that window out? You probably might not be able to. Well, and people don't understand, too, that whenever that pressure change happens and you manage to break the glass, like that water rushing in is going to hit you have to wait for the car to submerge before you can actually get out and a lot of people if you're taking too long you can only hold your breath so long that right. car submerging is going to take like 10 seconds so you you just lose so much time and i highly recommend that you guys go to killer b tacticals page and mm -hmm. watch some of his videos on like if an incident like this happens yep. and you're caught up he has so many really good videos about safety and stuff like that overall. Yeah, he talks a lot about how to actually do that. Right. Um, and in mm -hmm. his link tree, he has the link for the little keychain that you can get. Wow. Steve, Steve said he was stuck in a car filling up with water and was stuck for two and a half hours. That's my <laughs> friend right there, Steve. That's crazy. I would... I would be freaking out the whole damn time. The now whole, I, whole time. Now I know, Steve, why you don't sleep at night and you're always up like me in the middle of the night, right? I know you're laughing right now. So that's the other thing we're going to talk about. Speaking of all the drowning and everything, um, the Tennessee River drownings. Like that, I've been seeing all types of stuff about that lately. And... Right. I think the biggest one, the first one that I really saw that I paid attention to was um, the son and his dad were supposedly fishing. We, I, I don't know the actual story, but they were supposedly fishing and I'm assuming the son fell in, the dad went in to save him and couldn't and they both drowned, but the bodies washed up and like they weren't sure if it was a I don't know what we can say on here. A murder. I don't know if that's going to get us kicked. Lately, there have been like six or seven other bodies that have washed up. So they're starting to be like, oh my gosh, is this uh, someone who's doing a string of homicides? Murder. I like it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, well, I got very engrossed with the whole Riley Strain case. Right. And I went down the rabbit hole with that one. And I know that the autopsy just recently came back that he doesn't even have water in his lungs, but mm -hmm. he was in the water for almost two weeks. So something like is not adding up. The whole time, I kind of think that foul play was involved. But there's also so many conspiracy theories, but not only that, if you go down there by that water, the guardrail is super low. Like it should be built up way higher. And now I know that his family is trying to do another autopsy and uh, they found like three bodies searching for him. Mm -hmm. it, right. well, supposedly they just keep on coming up. Like how many bodies are actually in there? And that makes the problem. Like if it's not murder and it's just people literally falling in and drowning, 
how, like, what are they going to do to stop this? What safety precautions can be in place? Right. And also, my girl Michelle said there's also wet drowning, which you're absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. So you don't always necessarily have to have water. But you know what's crazy? And I feel like it's disrespectful as well. A lot of times these parents are going through these tragedies. It's great that we have different outlets to help, like TikTok, social media to help get the word out. Right. But then you have like a lot of psychic mediums coming on and saying like, oh, I talked to the ghost of so-and-so and I, and that starts the misinformation a lot of times. That is the, that is the problem with TikTok. Right. It, Everyone's a detective. Yeah, Everyone's a doctor. You just have to figure out who's actually doing this with good intentions. Cause like, I feel like you and I do this with good intentions, right. but there are a shit ton of people on here who don't. And it, it pulls people in. If, if you believe in something that someone's saying, whether it's wrong or right, if you believe in it, you're going to follow that person. And next thing you know, you're going to be following every single thing they say, even Which though- Which goes to right show notes. how easy it could be for mm -hmm. someone to just get lost in a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You got, you have to be careful on here, guys. You do. And, and that's something that I try and explain a lot. Like do your own research. Just, I even listening to me, I try and fact check all my stuff. I try and give accurate information. I talk to countless doctors and just everything, but you should still do the research yourself. Double check, because right. I'm, I'm wrong sometimes. Marie's wrong sometimes. There's been times, right. There's been times I've been corrected on here. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When things like that happen, that's when you have to be like, okay, you know what? You're right. I'm not a doctor. I don't know it all. Like. And can, own up to it. You can usually tell, though, because the people who won't own up to it, you can tell they're, oh, I'm right no matter what. Not a lot of times that's ego. I notice ego gets in the way of a yeah. lot of people like. Yeah. And, and once you start getting a following and stuff like that, it's very easy to let that ego kind of shine through. But it's it's still. I wish there was a way to control that. And that that's part of the reason for like the TikTok ban and everything is one, there's so much misinformation, false information. There have been like uh, police investigations and like really serious stuff going on that TikTok blew out of proportion, gave false information and it caused people to get hurt. This is the place for news nowadays and right. it's not really the place for news like it shouldn't be at least i trust tiktok news more than i trust like the news right well or google i come to tiktok to google things now like to look things up it's it's because the real news i mean for the past 20 years everybody figured out they have a agenda and it's all right. freaking bullshit I, I still don't know a news outlet that is not like promoting on a social media. I don't know a single news outlet that actually is truth. That is part of the problem with the and the whole reason why there's the TikTok ban. Um, the other part is uh, obviously Chinese um, getting our information and stuff like that. And the issue with all that is not only are they getting our information, but they are also feeding Americans what to watch. And that is what the US is concerned about. Like a lot of people on here are so freaked out about the TikTok ban. They don't want to lose their account and all that stuff. There are other social media areas. I know TikTok has been beneficial for a lot of people. I know it helps a lot of businesses, but there are also a lot of downfalls to it. And that's something it, depending on who ends up buying it, because I can't. You know, one of the that. downfalls that I see, a lot of these creators that their kids are their content, like the kids are their whole content. Like I'm talking like little cute little girls and yep. they're, look at the amount of saves on some of those videos. It will put goosebumps on your arms. Why do people need to save videos with children in them?
And I could understand if it was like two or three, because maybe like your ex is trying to keep tabs on you or, you know, get get something over on you. But there are 30 saves on a vid- uh, on a picture of Kyle. You kid. I've yeah. And I've gone to some of these larger accounts that like the kids are like the primary content. They got like five, six hundred thousand saves on mm-hmm. one video. That's like 14 million like views like crazy and nothing crazy. there's nothing actually to it because you can usually tell like even my videos i have videos that i make where i think people should save it like it right. makes i have other videos why in the hell would you save or share this like it just it's not about that and th- those are the ones that people share for some reason it's so freaking weird i know it is true. It's always like when you're given valuable information that like you think someone just wants a bookmark, mm-hmm. there's nothing. But it's like yep. weird when it's just like you and your child or like, so what did you find so interesting in that video that you felt the need to bookmark that particular video? Like, Right. 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 I don't know. That, that stuff is, yeah, it just yeah. was a like chill down my spine. I wanted to talk about Betty, our sponsor for this video and the past few actually. Betty is a life coach who specializes in addiction, specializes in couples coaching, specializes in job coaching, all types of aspects of life that I mean are super important. Just to give you guys a little incentive to seek help if you need help in any way. If you text Pod Talks to her, you get the very first session free and then you guys get to chat with her, see what it's and like. And I've got so much out of one session with her. Mm-hmm. I've done I've done quite a few sessions with her because I work with her. But let me tell you, one session is very valuable for her to be given away because the nuggets that I took from that helped me tremendously. She looks at things from a different viewpoint. Um, than a therapist. That's right. very important. So a lot of people, what you don't realize is a therapist helps you work on trauma and like your past trauma. Mm-hmm. A life coach helps you work with your your current life and right. moving forward. If you are just looking to better yourself in any way, I would highly suggest going to see Betty. Uh, prices do kind of vary based on what you're dealing with and what all's going on, but it's it's not super expensive as it is. So yeah, the the fact that she can also offer a whole session free and like give right. time just for you guys is freaking amazing. Kratom and kratom related deaths. Six months ago, there was a mom who she. From what I could tell, because I looked at multiple stories and they all kind of gave different information in some ways, but there was a mom who dealt with chronic pain, right? Uh, She was 31 years old and she couldn't get her pain medication anymore. Something happened with that and she started using Kratom. Now, from what everything said, it was being used responsibly. Her husband said she was using it responsibly and she took... Uh, She would just drink like two cups a day. Sometimes she would skip days. It all depended on how she felt. And then all of a sudden, one day she was making the kids lunch and she just fell over unalive. I don't necessarily not believe it, but according to the talk screens, there was nothing else in her system. I've taken enough Kratom to understand like it does some things to your body like I honestly feel like Kratom just tears up your insides but also if you aren't abusing it that like that's a long process so what happened that this woman just all of a sudden goes out Right. I wonder what other contributing health factors, Mm -hmm. like I'm sure when you look that up, like they're trying to solely say that it was Kratom related, correct? Right, right. So they probably looked into those contributing factors, obviously. She was young and healthy. That's the weird part. She was young and healthy. She was 31, had no other issues that I saw. And I, I guess it's just goes to say be careful what you're taking because it's just like this stuff out on the street this stuff is unregulated 
yes, it's manufactured in a factory and all types of stuff and, and supposed to just be the Kratom, but you never know what else you're getting in it. It could right. be some random um, like factory that has rats all over the place and they're peeing and, and supply and all types of stuff. And then you take that, there are diseases that you can get from that. So things do happen. That's why it's very big to have uh, FDA approved things. And yeah, you need to get it from a reputable website. There's a lot of them. There, there are a whole bunch. Um, it's really just don't go get it from like the gas station. Uh, right. Don't even smoke shops really aren't the best because a lot of them are going for bottom dollar. A lot of them aren't making crazy, crazy money. Uh, so they have to go for the cheaper products, even if it's not safe because it's not their responsibility anymore. Right. And you got to think like, how does all that, because especially a lot of people in recoveries struggle with issues with their liver, their liver enzymes being elevated. Mm -hmm. So when stuff like that is also going on, it's like it could potentially, you know, hurt you in the long run. So just be careful. And it's a sad, like hearing a mom passes because of that. And I guarantee you, because whenever you get uh, the little packages, at least as far as I know, it's been a long time since I've got them. But back in the day, that even the package would say it wouldn't actually have dosage information so you didn't know how much to take and then right. it would uh have a warning on the back i need to go like take a picture of it but it has a warning on the back that says like we are not responsible or liable for any health issues that these may cause and yada yada so they tell you right there that it's it's not controlled <laughs> and right. they they are not going to do anything if something happens to you but so if you haven't seen it there are basically little pill containers that it's just your normal everyday thing and in the pill container it dispenses your pills at a certain time and if you try and tamper with it or do anything to it it will destroy the pills that, that's the gist of it. Also, I want to make a really clear point. The doctor writes all of, like the details and the pharmacist is now going to be in control yeah. of putting like a time on the bottle. So it'll all be dialed into the bottle yep. so that like the pharmacist essentially has more control than the doctor at that point, in my opinion. I understand if the doctor signs off on it and even the patient signs off on it and it's just like, hey, I am re really struggling with taking my pills when I'm supposed to and I need help. So right. then they give you one of these and, you know, some of the concerns that are going to get brought up are what if something happens and the container just destroys them without, you know, me tampering? Uh, what if I take, you know, what if I need two or whatever? whole bunch of things can happen. But if there's a little bit of control over like you can only get a weak script if you have this. So if something happens, you aren't out for forever. My thought, I don't think that it's a great idea. It, mm -hmm. it might be a good idea for some people, but it takes the control away from the patient. What right. if you're on a vacation and you have your month's worth of medication on you and somehow you misdialed the bottle or something and it destroyed the rest of your meds. What right. are you going to do? What, what's going to happen? It's going to cause issues. It's going to cause people yelling at the pharmacist. It's mm -hmm. going to cause the pharmacist to have a bigger ego. The other part of it, Ricky said it would only be for people who want to use that mechanism or need to, not an everyday person. So I would hope that's how it's intended right off the bat. Me too. <laughs> But if they keep putting regulations on controlled substances because they've cut down pills like crazy, they may say the only way we can go back to our previous like prescribing methods of controlled substances is if every single bottle has these and now everybody is stuck with it. And that's kind of what I worry about. Me too. Um, they just... People like to abuse power, especially when it comes to this kind of thing, because there's so much stigma. 
And listen, I'm not a perfect person. Like as a mother, I'm responsible for myself as well as my kids and their meds. I mm -hmm. give them meds on a daily basis. Has there been a day where I might've skipped something by an accident? Even for myself, am I gonna be penalized for that? Are they gonna not give me my meds next month because like yeah. I forgot and there was an extra pill in the bottle? Like how strict is this gonna be? Because guess what? There's been times where I've taken an extra pill Yep. That might help in that situation because my mind is all over the place sometimes. And you're only human. You forget. Sometimes you need that extra pill. Right. Like, if well, I did it with my ADHD meds, not realizing. Like, I didn't remember taking it, and then I took another one. I'm like, oh, shit. I took another one. I could feel it, kind of. Well, and I wonder how it goes. Like, you know how some people take their stuff where it's you, you, you know, take it more as needed, which a lot of pain medications are like that. So right. you may have some days where you need five other days you need one. So where's where's the give and take with that? And then is that going to make the doctor be like, well, she took five this day and only one this day. So you're not getting as many. Like there's so many contributing factors. Right. What if you don't take a pill? Do you take it out the next time? That's what I was thinking. If you don't take a pill, do you still take it out and have it? Because then, I mean, if you aren't needing to take your full prescription, you could just stockpile pills and then it's not really going to matter. And I could see people doing that. A lot of other countries, you can get your pain medications and it's not like a huge controlled thing right and ashley and i talk so we're friends like on the side of here so when i talk to ashley like she's even told me like with her suboxone she goes to the pharmacy and does an induction really they make her put a pill under her tongue like and the pharmacy watches her instead of a doctor doing it which I, we we just had this conversation and i thought it was very different how does that right. work though? You, you just take your one, uh, you have to take it once a day and you go in every day. So like, yeah, a so like, yeah. so, so Ashley is coming from methadone to suboxone to sublocate. Okay. Uh, so she's, she just started her suboxone. So they, they do the induction at the pharmacy where okay. here we do our induction at the doctor's office which i thought was different i'm trying to think i guess well whenever i started i was in rehab though and i had to do that with like whenever it was time for your dose we sat in there had a little chair and i would always take my book in and had to take it and then show them it was all empty and stuff but I think that there's a lot of things that Ashley and I have discussed. I would love for Ashley to pop on here because honestly, there's so many different differences between Canada and the United States. Nadine's in here. She's another one from Canada. Nadine, if you want to hop on, let us know. Yeah, it will. And it's, I mean, it's everywhere. The U S is one of the only places where it's really, not clear cut on medication guidelines and stuff like that. There's so much constantly changing. And of course it's going to be like that everywhere, but it's not nowhere near the same, like not right. even close. I and agree. There's so many, like here, people struggle to even get an antibiotic when they're sick. Like right. you are not even going to have that doctor return your call half the time. I'm sorry, but that's what it is. I watched a video recently of a dude. He went into to Mexico, went into a pharmacy and they literally had everything behind the counter, like amoxicillin and all types of stuff. You can just go shop. So years ago I went on a cruise and I was addicted to Oxycontin at the time. Mm. And my ex had a prescription for oxys, and so did I. We the second that cruise ship docked in Mexico, you think we were at the beach? Where were we? At the pharmacy. And guess what? I had the pharmacist write me a prescription for oxycotton, and then I paid him for the oxycotton. So I had to pay him to write me the prescription. Sure. It was weird. I paid the pharmacist, and then. I bought the pills right off of them. Like we completely scored whatever we wanted. The pharmacist was like, oh yeah, oh, that's a controlled substance. You know, I did a little wheeling and dealing. And sure. then all of a sudden he's like, if you pay me, I'll, 
I'll, I'll take care of that for you. And I got out of there whatever I wanted. I wonder if it's still like that too. This, this might I add was in 2000. Right. So this right, was, right. this was like years ago. And I, I could remember like in Mexico, you could get date rape drugs right over the counter. Like you could get walk right. People were getting roofied at the bars like big time down there in Cancun because you could literally walk in the pharmacy and buy ketamine. You could buy whatever. The, back in the day when I was there, you could get whatever you wanted. And in that video, the uh, dude had asked the pharmacist just a little bit. And I, if I remember right, she was mentioning like there are a couple of things that you kind of have to have a script for, but it's it's hit or miss. Don't so what we did to make it even more believable, we showed the empty bottles that had Oxycontin written on it, like that showed our ID that it was us, like that we already have a script for that. That's how I got it back in the United States because I poured, they gave me like the original, like the big Oxycontin bottle from like behind the pharmacy. I and I just poured it into my bottles. Do you think that would be better here? Like if it was like that here, how do you think that would go? Honestly, I feel like it would eliminate a lot of the people from doing harmful things. I feel like it's a form of harm reduction because people should have access to the medications that they want and or need. Like I feel like if, if your back's hurting and you need a Tylenol 3, you could walk right in. You could buy Tylenol 3 in like any other country right over the counter. Right. Why? Why can't you do that here? I feel like it would really eliminate a lot of it. It helps with the illicit supply too, because you don't need any of that stuff. I mean, if That's you really- I agree. It, you, people aren't gonna be putting uh, fentanyl and xylazine and nidazines right. and stomping down the drug supply because you're just, you could buy it right from the pharmacy. You know it's legit. It is harm reduction in my opinion. I got put into situations, like even Kyle, calling in scripts of benzos because I was cut off of benzos, like without being titrated down. Look at the shit that I put myself into mm -hmm. because things were never handled the way that they should have been. It would eliminate it so much. So if you guys have any questions, you have any topics, you have whatever, it doesn't matter. If you have anything you want to talk about, just... Or add in to anything that we've been discussing currently, yep. feel free. All right, what's up, homie? Hey, how's it going, guys? I just brief, real quickly here, got off of pills. Okay. And I did this uh, cold turkey. My daughter was unalived January 31st of last year. Um, and she also was on drugs. They were going to rob her, but she had nothing. She had, they got a makeup bag. And I literally, I was in a car accident. Like, so, I mean, I legitly have pain, but I just decided that I don't even freaking care anymore. Right. Um, I just called my doctor doctor and i was like i'm done like maybe i'll go get an injection like and I'm, don't you work in the field of like doctors pain I, management i okay. yes yeah, so um and i was still working at a pain clinic when this happened that's when i got the call there um i'm a surgery scheduler but yeah i called my doctor and i was like yeah i'm, I'm quitting um and they were like hey we'll call you in some promethazine at least and I was like, okay, like, but I'm just done. Um, and at this time I was on um, Norco's and Xanax and I have not touched it since this year of her anniversary, January 3rd. I gotta say, Michelle, you are, I, I don't know how you did it, especially with the Xanax at such a difficult time. That just shows me the inner strength that you really have because you wanted to not forget those feelings that you were feeling. You probably knew how important it was to process and remember everything. Well, and so that's the other thing, like, so I was on Wellbutrin as well, I've stopped that. And so this wow. is a very hard process because these feelings are coming up that I did not even know were there. 
So I am right. definitely processing a lot right now. And it's it's hard. And that's why I keep saying it is for some people, it is mind over matter. Right. Um, and so this is a very hard struggle right now, but it's what I want to do. And I'm just determined to be present, be in it. I do need to feel it because there's things like I'm like last year, I'm like, wait, what? That happened? I don't even remember that, you know? Right. And so trauma probably makes your memory not as sharp too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. People are telling me things and I'm like, oh, wait, what? Like there, yeah, there are just things I just, I remember the freaking phone call and that, and that's about it, you know, <laughs> but I support everything. Um, you know, like I said, I worked in the pain clinics. I know what people have to go through. So do what you got to do. I'm there for you. Um, starting over, you got to do it. You got to do what you got to do and support right. family members. You know, that's one thing I can say about my daughter. She was here at Christmas. Her birthday's on New Year's. She was here. We celebrated. I, you know, she she stayed here while I had to go to work and watch her kids. Um, like, because I trusted her in the house. I trusted her with her kids. She, she was an awesome mom. She put her kids first. She FaceTimed them and put them to sleep. That's one thing she did um, is she was always present with her kids. Um, is she put them first, even though she knew she was doing wrong. You know what though, at least at the end of that time, she had good memories, I'm guessing, at least good memories with you and a, a decent relationship instead of you pushing her away and being like, I don't ever want to see you. And then something like that happens. Well, thank you for thank coming you. on, Michelle, and sharing yeah. that with us. And then Steffi wanted to hop on. I just want to say this to both of you, what you are doing, please forgive me because I get so emotional. You're okay. You are giving us the other side of the coin hope. You fill our cups because sometimes they are so empty. They are so empty when you are trying to love someone in active addiction. So please right. remember this, that on the days where you guys feel drained and you feel like, because there's going to be those moments where you're triggered and what you guys are doing is breaking the stigma and you are filling our cups and i need to say thank you for that because you will never know what that does for me on a personal level that is just it's priceless you cannot put you can't put a price on that because we get lost we get lost and we get so deflated because i often say especially when it's your child i don't know if it hits different when it's your kid because if my husband was pulling this shit, i don't know what i would do it would be different i think but when it's your kid and we are so programmed to think that we have to let them hit rock bottom and leave them out there i can't live with that Right. And I just did a video and there's this moment that I just really want to share just briefly that in Nehemiah's addiction, he was homeless. And this was just, I would say last month sometime, I met him where he was. And you know, when I would go to meet him, it was, I never had any hesitation about where he was. I always made sure I was safe, but in this moment, I had two bologna sandwiches, a couple bags of chips and some Gatorade. I remember was, that video. Yeah, and he could barely stand up. And you know what I did? I got out of my car and I said, no, no, you're good. And I sat right there on that curb with him and we had a bologna sandwich. We didn't talk about anything. He already knows. I mean, I think that's the thing that I've learned for myself. When loving someone in addiction, especially active addiction, they already know, they beat themselves up worse than anyone could right. ever beat themselves up. Yep. For me, sometimes just being there, just being in that presence. And what I took away from that in that moment was not that, oh my God, my son's a dry dad, look where he's at. I got to look in my child's face, tell him that I loved him. And I left and that was a cherished moment for me. The ups and the downs are so high and so low when you're on this side of the coin. But what I always encourage people to do, those little things are what matter because you never know, like my sister that was just on here and I got to meet her. She actually flew in from Alaska at one point and we actually met up for coffee, which was amazing. And we've, dis we've developed this sisterhood and- I love that.
Yeah. And I think that people, you have to remind yourselves that those moments, because I can live with that. The choice is Brandy Mac. She's another person that you guys need right. to follow. Literally, it's those cherished moments that keep you going. As small as they are, those are small victories. And they give that person something to hold on to. And I really, really stress this to people that by you guys sharing your story, me sharing my story, that people no longer feel alone. They don't feel embarrassed. And I know what that's like because even within my family, I got judged for how I was handling Nehemiah. They always, oh, well, he's an addict. But okay. I'm like, first of all, address him by his name because he's not just an addict. He's a father. He's a son. He's a, we throw people that are battling the disease of addiction under this title. And then that's all that they are. That's all that they become. Recently, Nehemiah started, instead of smoking, he started poking, if everybody knows what I mean. And he ended up at the ER. Maybe within 24 hours, he wouldn't be in here anymore because his whole entire arm from the middle of the forearm to the top of the arm was the size of a football on each side and ended up having to have emergency right. surgery. And then now, what is he, back in a program now? Well, yeah, so he went to a detox program. It's a dual diagnosis center, and it was, listen, when I got there, 24 hours later, they finally called me. I don't know why. I got there. He had no patient advocate. He had no social worker. He was in there talking about unaliving himself. Wow. It had not been reported. They are Those nurses are mandated reporters to the psych ward. Up, they have. By the time I left, he had a one-on-one -on -one care person that didn't leave him the entire stay of the hospital stay. He had a caseworker. I mean, I didn't know the language that I needed to use, but I found out very quickly because I Good knew job. That he was just being labeled as an addict. And right. the psychiatrist literally on the phone with me shed tears and said, worth saving. I've never done this before. I've never hopped on a live. So thank you for having me. We appreciate you coming on. Honestly, yeah. guys. But listen, so you Steffi guys just remember, please, please remember that in those moments where your triggers come, I hope you hear my voice that for me, you fill my cup.